he still can't figure out how to attack Kamala. Yeah. Like, and and it's it's really kind of enjoyable to watch him play. Like, we're, we're on the fourth nickname, Comrade Kamala, which I, which I don't think is particularly inspired. She's a nasty woman. He's back to nasty woman. It's just not landed. Just, it's just, he just doesn't have it. Hello and welcome to the Bullard Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Miller. It is Labor Day, but podcasting isn't really labor. <laughs> so, you know, we're working, right, Bill? I, I always thought on labor, shouldn't Labor Day be a day when you do labor? I mean, it should, it be, should it not be called like non Labor Day or break from no, Labor right. Day or something? Break, Rest break and relaxation, for, leisure day. I don't know. It seems yeah, <laughs> leisure day for laborers, but this is our leisure. Exactly. This is just us hanging out with you, talking about politics. Um, last night, I, I don't want to just go too overboard on the sports metaphors here, because sometimes some of our listeners, it turns them off. But don't know if you watched it, but my beloved LSU Tigers uh, lost to USC. There were a couple of times in the fourth quarter where they had the ball, where they were winning, where all they really had to do was just punch it in, you know, close the deal. They were winning very slightly, and um, and they just were unable to do it. They got a little too conservative. They let They let USC catch up. And I kind of feel like that's where the state of the race is right now for Kamala Harris. So hopefully the end will be better. But she's up by a little bit. But I, I, I want to make sure that we are putting our pedal to the metal for the last two months. How's that metaphor strike you? Yikes. I mean, I, I don't follow <laughs> LSU football as closely as you, but that sounds sounds both correct, I mean, plausible, as, uh, sounds correct as an analysis of where we are and plausible as an, uh, unfortunately, somewhat plausible as an analysis of where we might end up. I, I hope not. And I, I guess I think not, but I think they do understand they have to stay on the offense and not go into, uh, you know, like a prevent defense too early and, and so forth. Though, and, and I think she did a little bit of prevent defense at that interview. When was that? Thursday night with CNN, with Dana Bash. But that was, yeah. I think, tactical for that night, not for the next nine weeks, I hope and trust. Yeah, I hope that's true. Because things are good. The vibes have been good. We had, we had a new ABC poll out, which has her up 52 46, which is our biggest lead in the polls yet. Um, could be an outlier. It's one poll. Um, it's the biggest lead that we've seen, though, in an individual. I'm sure we'll be getting more this week. Uh, and and so there is this kind of sense that I was on with JVL. At, at, we were doing, I guess, the next level maybe a week or two ago. And he, and, and he was like, what, what does the equilibrium of this race look like? And it kind of feels like we actually reached it very quickly, yeah. right? Which is a na- very narrow Harris lead. And, 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 you know, I think that is what takes us to, is it possible for her to expand that up? What can be done to continue to drive Trump down even further? And um, we were texting over the weekend about one of uh, one of the ads that the Super PAC is, is, is running. So I, I want to listen to that in the context of kind of where they where they see the race. I'm running to fight for an America where the economy works for working people where you only have to work one job to pay the bills, and where hard work is rewarded, where reproductive rights are not just protected by the Constitution of the United States, but guaranteed in every state, because that's our America. And that's the America I believe in. FF PAC is responsible for the content of this ad. So more money has been spent on that ad than any other piece of creative in the campaign so far. And it is just a little like, okay, <laughs> that's okay for me i don't know that's fine but uh you know i don't know this is this is where maybe it's my grumpiness coming off that loss last night but this is where i wake up this morning and i'm like i want blood in the teeth because the trump ads that i was seeing during the football games are are, are ag- aggressive on the other hand right and, and i think that reflects kind of where both campaigns say that think that they are right that the kamala harris super PAC is still doing a gauzy kind of treatment such as that. And the Trump ad is like, Kamala Harris let out, you know, these horrible criminals and, you know, that doing the whole uh, Willie Horton deal. Yeah, my, my glass half full vibes kicked in over the weekend too. I thought the terrible Trump behavior at Arlington, is it spinning the other way now? He's got the families out there saying they invited him. He's got a ton of people lying about, you know, the rules of Arlington and so forth. Uh, Harris weighed in finally with a statement, but uh, you know, on the, the ultimately the, the death of those thirteen uh, soldiers, Marines uh, in Afghanistan, isn't great for the Biden Harris administration. Obviously, so I, I don't know. I, I got nervous also this week. I just a couple of things: the ABC Post plus six, the Wall Street Journal poll, which is a very good poll, 
is plus one Harris. So let's just assume it's, I assume it's a three to four point race right now, right. which is right on the bubble of winning. If, if you think about the electoral college, she's behind where Clinton and Biden were at this point in the polls, but maybe they've corrected the polls, you know, to, to pick up the, the, uh, the formerly shy Trump voters. Maybe they aren't formerly yeah. shy Trump voters. So maybe that's not a, the right comparison. This is one of these things people could obsess about now, but basically it's, it's I think she has a slight edge. Uh, and I'm a little worried that ad that you played, it's a perfectly okay issue ad, but I don't know. Does it convince anyone who isn't already basically for reproductive rights and, you know, isn't already for Harris? I think that's the right, right. The question. Is, I guess I have a slightly, so I have two views which are in contradiction with one each other. One, I like very much share your notion that she has to punch Trump in the nose. She has to do it in person at the debate. I'm not sure how much paid media will do on that. People are used to seeing anti-Trump ads at this point. Yeah, right. Seeing her personally stand up to Trump and land a few blows, I think is very important. But the other thing is on the issue stuff, I still think the bio ads, the bio biographical ads might work well for Harris. Her favorable, the one thing that we know is that's happened in the last several weeks is her fit personal favorable, unfavorable, uh, personal, but her favorable, unfavorable, which presumably captures what people think of her, not so much the approval of Biden, Harris, the policies and so forth, is about even. I think it was 49.50 maybe in the ABC poll, something like that, which is very good compared to where Biden has been, where she has been. She's been minus 13. And good compared to Trump, who's about minus nine, minus 10 in favorable, unfavorable. If she can make this election, who do you like better? Who, who do you who, who, who do you respond to better, which is not nothing in a presidential race where they're going to be in your living room, yes. so to speak, for four years. I think she wins. If it's on these issues, then it's a little bit up in the air, you know, which which mistake of Trump versus which mistake of, of the Biden administration or or which policy of Harris's that can get, you know, mischaracterized or characterized. It isn't that popular. So I guess I'm slightly... On the one hand, I think she needs to punch Trump. On the other hand, I think actually she still needs to build herself up. If she is a favorable fave, unfave on election day, she will win, I believe. If her yeah. favorable, unfavorable sinks down to where Trump's is, even if it's about the same as Trump's, I suspect Trump wins. Yeah, well, this is why the, the people don't talk about double haters anymore because there aren't any. There's a small handful, and and I, it's because people like her. I mean, you know, besides MAGA and Republicans, and uh, and so I do think that continuing. I, I guess that's a, just a distinction. It's not that I don't want them to run, run positive ads, because I, I, I agree with you. I think that the bi people are still learning about her, right? Kind of, right? And they and part, I think that's part of the reason why they like like her favorability is going up, right? Because she's been pleasantly surprised, and you see this in the polls, but. Uh, you see it in focus groups of Sarah's focus groups. Right. You listen to those. Uh, you see it at my life. Like we had people over for the game last night and people are like, yeah, boy, she's really surprised me. I liked her better than I thought I did. And I had a misperception about her, you know? And so a lot of that has been her performance. You can supplement that with paid, right? By telling people things about her that, that they don't know um, about her background, whether it's DA or his prosecutor. Um, and so I, I think that's good. And that, and that gives her more, room to grow for sure but we just got to do it let's do it yeah that's how the bio i don't know what you found it's just in personal interactions i think it's a little bit in sarah's focus groups too it's both the da prosecutor but actually it's her middle class origins working in mcdonald's yes. the family the mom and so forth i actually think yes. some of that which was so successful right. at the convention uh, they shouldn't just assume they've done the job on that 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 they could continue yeah. that that stuff for quite a while i think for sure and that, and uh the the other thing she's got going for Trump has really made a mess about of the abortion situation when we when we last taped on Friday with Margaret Hoover at that time Margaret and I were talking about this and Trump had kind of implied he was going to vote for the Florida abortion measure because he doesn't like the six week ban and then a spokesperson had put out a statement saying that he did he did not say that that he was just expressing his dis disapproval with the six week limit in Florida. Um, and then the next day after we taped over the weekend, the next day, um, Trump then comes around and says, I'm not going to vote for this. I'm, I'm going to vote no on the, on the Florida measure that would enshrine abortion rights. I, I mean, both just like that, the fact that he's going to vote no, like that just that's a nugget that people can say that he is going to vote against a bill. So if you're wondering what would happen when it comes to his desk, he's going to vote against a bill that would uh, enshrine abortion rights uh, in, in the law in Florida. Uh, I, I think that hurts him with some of these potential voters. And then also just the flailing about about it um, is is demonstrating somebody that 
you know, I think recognizes the weak position that he's in. Yeah, certainly. I mean, he never seems to pay a price much for the flailing about, especially if he ends up in sort of a reasonable place. And But here on abortion, I just think they need to say, Trump is going to veto any attempt to protect re- reproductive rights that Congress passes, whether it's abortion, and then just describe all well, the Project 2025 yeah. stuff to him. So it's not just, you know, codifying Roe, but it's also IVF, and it's also contraception. I mean, without getting in too much in the weeds, but they need to get a little bit specific on that. Because I think... Yeah, I think I think the issue remains very strong. There's just a huge amount of data for that on that for swing for Democrats and for swing voters. And they need to and Trump finally decided that he had to go along with the base on voting I can never remember it's for against voting against the constitutional amendment that would protect yeah. abortion rights in Florida, voting against that. And I think they just need to wrap that around his neck. Yeah, absolutely. I was kind of surprised that he yeah. felt the need to do that. I, I mean, and to me that shows that that there was actually some real pressure. It's, it's always hard for me to tell, like, when, you know, a handful of, of prominent evangelicals express disappointment with Trump about something. Uh, you know, part of me is like, does he give a flip about them anymore? I mean, like, he already has got them wrapped around his finger, right? Uh, like, they've already made the deal with the devil. Like, they're stuck with him now. Um, but the the fact that he felt pressured to say no makes me think that they... Uh, that they thought that they had some real issues on their, you know, with within the base on this because it's not like it's fucking Trump. It's not like Trump hasn't not answered a question before. I mean, he still hasn't given his health care plan right. ten years later. Like he could have just not told anybody how he's going to vote on that bill the whole election. I mean, I that, that say, ballot measure, rather. I mean, it's not just the base. I think it's probably. Don't you think maybe more the 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 evangelicals who are have been put off by Trump and maybe a little more now after the last two, three years and just seeing just how bad it is in terms of his character and, and the messages and what, what Trumpism is. But the life issue is the one that they come back to, you know, they are with Trump on or, or with Trump nominal, not Trump's true views, but with what Trump's right. policies on, let's just say, yeah. and against Harris's policies. And you just got to get that issue back, not so much to kind of turn out that last true believing Trump is, but to turn out that, evangelical who's turned off by trump a bit but who's right. still for for her maybe it's mostly her for her that pro-life issue remains very important yeah it's there's there's some baggage on it ever wonder how much of your personal data is out there on the internet for anybody to see more than you think your name contact info social security number home address even information about your family members all of it being compiled by data brokers and sold online sometimes it's getting sold to nefarious actors you don't want to have it uh One example recently, I got called by a scammer that had my address and my signature. They were trying to convince me that I need to pay them because I'd forgotten to go to jury duty or something, which is kind of the thing I might do. But so it was a little bit believable, but I sniffed it out. But it's a reminder that I've got too much information out there. I'm a very minor public figure. I don't want everybody having my data. And that's why I personally recommend Delete Me. Delete Me is a subscription service that removes your personal info from hundreds of data brokers. Sign up and provide Delete Me with exactly what information you want deleted, and their experts take it from there. Delete Me sends you a regular personalized privacy report showing what they found, where they found it, and what's removed. Delete Me isn't just a one-time service. It's always working for you, constantly monitoring and removing the personal information you don't want on the internet. To put it simply, Delete Me does all of the hard work of wiping you and your family's personal information from data broker websites. Take control of your data and keep your private life private by signing up for Delete Me. Now at a special discount just for our listeners. Today, get 20% off your Delete Me plan when you join deletemecom slash bulwark and use promo code bulwark at checkout. The only way to get 20% off is to go to joindeleteme.com slash bulwark and enter code bulwark at checkout. That's joindeleteme.com slash bulwark code bulwark. And some more, an, another piece of evidence that Trump is still flailing about a little bit and not, t- you know, um, doing anything to reshape this race back in his favor. Uh, he still can't figure out how to attack Kamala. Yeah. Like, and, and it's, it's really kind of enjoyable to watch him play. Like, we're, we're on the fourth nickname. Comrade Kamala, which I, which I don't think is particularly inspired, and um, and here's here's a new attack on you tried out on her with uh, with Mark Levin last night. Let's let's listen to that. And now they have Kamala, who they say has many deficiencies, but she's a nasty person. Uh, the way she treated Mike Pence was horrible. 
The way she treats people is horrible. What, uh, what was that again? <laughs> the way Kamala treated Mike Pence was horrible. <laughs> I mean, like what? Where did that, what does that even come from? The debate, I guess, the one time they ever encountered each other in 2020. Yeah. But it was just a normal um, debate, right? She didn't treat him horribly. <laughs> yeah, it was just a normal debate. Last I checked, I mean, she did not send an angry mob of people to hang him. <laughs> like, I don't, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. Uh, like, the, this is where we need the George Conway in the episode. Like, just this, the level of sociopathy that you have to be at for him to, that it doesn't even cross his mind. Like, maybe Mike Pence, treating Mike Pence poorly shouldn't be the example that he goes to. Because he just doesn't, like, think about other people's feelings, right? Like, literally, I don't think that it probably doesn't even occur to him the fact that, um, I mean, he literally left my, it was his responsibility that, that Mike Pence had to get his family and flee yeah. from, a, from a mob. Yeah. What a, what a person. Um, that's, it's, it was interesting to watch. She's a nasty woman. He's back to nasty woman. It's just not landed. This, it's just, he just doesn't have it with her right now. I mean, I assume at the debate, they will give him three or four or five reasonably effective lines against the policies that have failed or are sure. perceived to have failed most in the, for the Biden Harris administration, Afghanistan, inflation, the border, and just hammer on, I mean, it'd be crazy not to, honestly. And, and then it becomes a question of how well she both defends herself, but also how much, how effectively she punches back. For me, that, yeah, I agree. All this other stuff is just him indulging himself. Maybe A, they can't persuade him what to say, or B, they just figure it doesn't matter what he says this week. It's all, it's all the debate anyway. The fact, going into the debate, I agree. But it's just like the fact that they cannot... I mean, they've gone through all of like the paint by numbers political attacks. You know, she's a communist. She's extreme. She's a flip flopper. You can't trust her. And then, and then they've laid layered on top of the paint by numbers attacks the old things that only Trump would do. Like she's not really black. She's a DEI hire, right? It's like, and uh, but there, it just it isn't. None of it is is really working. And and I and I and in some ways they counteract each other in a way that has has limited their ability to um, effectively define her so far, right? Like, like yes. what would you say? Like, if you just look at it right now, like, I can, I can think about what I think would be the most effective attack on, on Kamala Harris, but I, we don't really know because they haven't, they haven't, you know, they haven't dialed in on anything. I mean, maybe the good news might be that their polling and focus groups don't give them an obvious line of attack. They're all limited in certain ways or don't work yeah. with some subsets of voters. Um, it's funny that Trump's so they, obsessed with it's funny. It's the way he is, right? He thinks the personal attacks is what will win for him. I mean, yeah. I'm not going to say he's wrong, but maybe he's unfortunately and sadly right. I guess my view as I'm having been around politics for a while, but thinking maybe that we're more, still in a normal political situation is you have an administration that has a 40% approval rating. 65% of the country think we're on the wrong track. Just attack the most unpopular policies of a relatively unpopular administration of which she's vice president. This isn't very complicated. And right. normally that would put the challenger in a pretty, pretty good place. But that's not the way Trump thinks. Yeah. And to be fair, maybe it's not the way politics works anymore. I don't know. Yeah. The uh, the other thing that in, in theory you could come up with is the phoniness, right? Like that she flip-flopped on certain things and et cetera. Problem with that is yeah, when you have J.D. Vance delivering that attack, and you've, cho you've chosen J.D. Vance, I mean, he's he's one of the most phony people that we've seen on the national stage. Uh, th there was one J.D. Vance quote from over the weekend. Uh, this the guy just did so many podcasts. I just I do have to say, I think that my future ambitions for vice president are pretty limited by the amount of podcasting I've been doing because I'm not an asshole like J.D. Vance, but still, when, you know, when you just when you're producing the level of commentary <laughs> that JD was apparently producing on podcasts. Uh, there's just a lot of material to work with. Uh, I, I say the opposite. It shows that you've got a bright political future. He's the vice presidential <laughs> nominee uh, for one of the two major parties at age 39. Just keep it up, Tim, you know? Okay. Thanks, Bill. Um, uh, here's one of his latest podcast moments that was resurfacing uh, following about the Afghanistan withdrawal. Apparently Afghanistan is a country of translators and interpreters. Because every single person that's coming in, that's what they say this person is, a translator and an interpreter. Um, he was saying that as part of a rant about how we should not be bringing in any immigrants or you know any, any refugees, any people seeking asylum from Afghanistan, not including the people that risked their lives to help 
uh, the, uh, the American military and help our, help our country and help our, people like our friend, Will Selber. I, it is just like, it is astonishingly callous. Yeah. And, and like, and you lay it on top of like the comments about not caring about Ukraine, about the childless cat ladies, about how miserable single women are, about how it creeps him out for there to be a single teacher. I, I he just comes off as a monstrous douche. I, I, there's just no other way around it. Yeah, I, I the, agree. And uh, the Afghanistan stuff in particular, aren't we proud that we, I mean, we were at some, the ending of the war in Vietnam was a sad moment, but we did take in half a million Vietnamese and they've done very well in this country. And I think we think that was kind of the least we could do. And in Afghanistan, yeah. maybe we had to pull out. I'm not going to relitigate all that, but taking in the people who actually work for us, who were in danger and their families are in danger. Some of them and their families have been killed by the Taliban and by the people running Af- Afghanistan now. And the idea that we wouldn't, uh, take them in. And incidentally, there are no horror. I mean, I don't know exactly how they're doing. It's probably too early to do the socioeconomic studies. But my impression here in Northern Virginia, where there are a lot of uh, Afghans who, who sought asylum and have been resettled here, is they're doing fine and they're working hard and they're admirable people. So, but it's, it's so, yeah, you're right. It's just so callous in a way that I don't think previous candidates, whatever their views on immigration policy were, were, yeah. were they didn't sound like this. What a demean just the humanity of these people. Well, well I'll, I'll put in the show notes. There's a beautiful story about, about our friend, our former colleague, Will Selber and, and his translator that he helped get back here in, was it in USA today? It was, it was in USA the paper today. last week. Uh, yeah. And it was, it's really, really lovely. And, and some Bulwark readers actually had been contributing to a GoFundMe to help get him home. Right. So um, it is, it's a nice contrast with how JD Vance looks at, uh, looks at folks that were uh, trying to help us and, are just trying to come to the land of milk and honey. Um, what the last thing uh, we do have to end on a sad note uh, on, on the foreign policy side of things. Since last podcast over the weekend, uh, there was an Israeli military operation in Rafa, um, or I guess on the IDF, were going into tunnels and uh, Hamas. Then before they could get there, executed uh, six hostages, uh, including uh, Hirsch Goldberg, Poland, who's an American, whose parents spoke at, at both conventions. Um, just a horrific story. And, and, you know, I, I don't, I don't really have big political thoughts on this. Uh, the thing that has frustrated me most about the Israel situation is like when a, when a thing like this happens, like I see on the internet that, you know, the, the people that are the most fervent in their backing of Israel respond to it by saying, see, like Kamala Harris was wrong about this. Like we needed to do even more aggressive attacks to go in. And, and then people that are, that are, critical of BB. There's plenty to be critical of BB or like, see, like this is, you know, we didn't, this happened because we didn't get a, get to a deal. And we, when we, we gave them too many weapons. And I just, I don't know that there's a clear answer here um, because we're, we're dealing with people that just their levels of human, of, of caring about, about humanity and compa- caring about the, uh, the hostages that they took. It's just pretty, pretty much zero. Yeah, the obviously what happened on October seventh was horrible. The taking of hostages was a horrible part of that, um, and the killing of a murder of hostages subsequently is, I guess, even well, also horrible. So, I mean, what can one, what can one say? Yeah, the degree to which everyone takes, I wouldn't say they even take ten seconds to say what you and I just said. They go right to the political attacks, right? I mean, it's like yeah. they don't even pause for you know. <laughs> For, for, as I say, for a decent moment, a decent interval before going to that. And in fact, it's, I mean, look, Israel itself, there are massive demonstrations, including by people who are not, uh, who are pretty conservative or pretty much on the right in Israeli po- political scene, uh, criticizing this on Yahoo for not prioritizing getting the hostages back. There are people defending. Biden, I guess, said that this morning in just yeah. a very brief answer to a question. And there are people also and I'm weirdly, I'm very anti Netanyahu, but on this, I, I don't know what I think. I mean, maybe though at the end of the day, Netanyahu's right. You can't have an entire military operation hinge on, you know, uh, not, not doing certain things you really think you have to do for the safety of the country because of a threat to kill hostages. So I, it just, I mean, harsh as that is to say, so I really don't know. Yeah. Uh, maybe a lesson everybody could take from it. The thing that got me a little emotional over the weekend was, uh, uh, I guess Luke Bernard post, posted a picture of, of Hirsch Goldberg's, Goldberg Poland's bedroom. And uh, he had in there a, uh, like a painting, I guess, um, that says Jerusalem is everyone's and then has it in Hebrew and in Arabic. And it feels like that is the model that everybody should be looking towards. Um, any other uh, final thoughts, Bill? 
from the weekend? Any other takeaways? Uh, no, people should enjoy the rest of their non-laboring Labor Day, assuming they're not la not laboring. And um, I guess what? Nine weeks to go in this election. It's unbelievable. I cannot believe we're at Labor Day 2024. Um, we uh, will be back tomorrow. We've got uh, we got a double header. We've got Mona Charon. Mona Charon wrote this amazing piece called what are we conserving exactly i don't know if that was exactly the headline but that was the sense of it what are conservatives conserving what are we conserving it was wonderful i want to talk to her about that uh, we've also got senator brian shots it's going to be a good episode enjoy your labor day i hope everyone had a wonderful weekend i hope your sunday night was a little bit better than mine was though it was fine we had fellowship bill you know I had you're, you're putting on a brave front here tim i'm impressed i i was waiting for the text this morning you know can't do the show this morning i mean we have to put it off for you know a few days here but, but I'm, you're, you're, you're you're playing you're you're in your stiff upper lip as the british used to say i can't spin it it was a brutal loss though <laughs> we had people over it was lovely everyone was having a good time the bourbon was flowing we were chatting and then you know anyway Sometimes, sometimes it just doesn't go out the way you want. Uh, Bill Crystal, we'll, we'll see you back here next Monday. Everybody else will see you tomorrow. Hope you had a wonderful weekend. Peace.